Hello and welcome to DitoCast episode 512, recorded live on Sunday, April 1st. Uh, happy April Fool's Day and also happy Easter. A dangerous combination, probably. Uh, I'm your host, Patrick. With me this week, we have returning to the show, Voodoo. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. Happy Easter, everyone. Yeah, and we also have Antha with us today. Hey, thanks for having me back. Happy Easter. Yeah. Uh, this week's screenshot... Uh, kind of a fun one here. Uh, Tyronis Rex hit, hunts amid giant mushrooms in the 360 s- screenshot of the week. Uh, thanks to Clayford for sending in this screenshot. Uh, very lovely uh, pose and color. I was trying to figure out what weapons he was using. Uh, pretty slick. Uh, we like to talk about Dungeons & Dragons online nearly every weekend. You can catch us through Twitch, YouTube, the DDO forums, iTunes, or our website, titocast.com. Titocast is hosted by CyberEars, the awesome podcast hosting network. Shows are usually available within a few days of recording, and the next show will probably be next Sunday. You can stay updated by following us on our social media pages or our website, titocast.com, with our calendar. Uh, on the podcast this week, uh, we've got Update 38, Version 2, Hit Lemanium. Uh, so we get to talk about that. A lot of fun stuff there. Uh, we have two weeks of community news. I took last week off. <laughs> I got to uh, got home in the kind of like short window where I could possibly make a show happen, and I turned into a vegetable, <laughs> so it didn't happen. Um, and then we also have part three of four of our end game discussion on end game then and now. Uh, so we'll, that'll be at the end of the cast. Uh, for now, let's talk about game news. Uh, so like I mentioned, update 38, version 2, hit Lamania. Uh, so it was up for three days, the typical Tuesday to Thursday kind of time frame. Um, there are uh, a few uh, kind of changes and whatnot. So I'm not going to hit like everything that uh, was already in there, but we'll hit some of the changes here. Uh, I will say really quickly, uh, I really appreciated what they did this time around with um, all of the different... Uh, Something we'll talk about where they're reposting things that already existed. They, they color coded what was new. <laughs> Please do that in the future, devs. That was fantastic. That was really nice. Yeah, it really pops out too. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, so, some of the new stuff um, Monk's Shintao, uh, the Touch of the Void Dragon, which is the second to last um, core, and Secret Perfection, which is the last core. Um, so, Touch of the Void Dragon lost five melee power, and the or now gives 5 melee power, which I think was down from 10. And to Seek Perfection now gives 15 melee power, which was down from 25, um, which continues the nerfing of monks. Uh, they're losing quite a bit of melee power. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how melees play um, going forward, <laughs> given how much melee power they're, they're pulling out. Um, let's see. Other stuff that was in here... Um, Projectiles from cold, bo- cold bolt r- rune arms are now twice as large and now have homing, um, so that will be nice for those folks. Um, characters who this will be in- important. Uh, characters who currently have one or more druid levels should receive a plus three heart of wood in their inventory when they log in, um, which is a, a nice, uh, nice little toss out there. I have a feeling though, I'll, there's a lot of druid builds that have more than three levels of uh, other classes like the melee build that were kind of, shall we say, gaming the system of what you could do with a melee druid. Uh, but still, plus three is better than nothing. Uh, and then they did a whole bunch of stuff on the on the Test Jojo, which um, if you're interested in what they're doing with the Test Jojo, you can check out the release notes there. So guys, update 38, are you excited? Yes. <laughs> it says the druid. <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't even play a melee druid. Why are you so excited? Well, they made some really quality changes to Caster Druid, and you know they didn't just slap up a third tree. Like they they gave the Caster Druid tree some TLC, and they made a lot of quality of life changes, including making some some significant changes in existing spells that are just awesome. And I love that they added some low hanging fruit in the new Bear Tank tree. That you know, if you want to add some defensiveness to like your caster, there's some there's some uh, low hanging fruit that you can get uh, without a lot of without a big investment of action points. How about you, Antha? I'm uh, very excited. I play mostly a um, a caster druid, 
but I think this is going to have me um, go pretty heavy into the uh, the wolf tree. Yeah, it's got some uh, some nice features that I'm definitely wanting to check out. I do not play a caster druid. I am a terrible caster druid. I do have a wolf though. A lot of fun. Uh, let's talk about druids since we kind of start talking about there. Um, so some of the new stuff. Uh, so they reduced the basic wolf form attack speed bonus to 20% now. Uh, I think they had taken it down to 10%. So I think they're, they're boosting it back up a little bit. Uh, Winter wolf attack speed has been boosted to 35%. Um, which, I'm not it's kind of totally clear if that was like the... Because they, what they were doing was you originally winter wolf speed uh, increased with every druid level you had, uh, which is still in the release notes. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. Um, but it looks like they, they boosted the, the speed back up a little bit. Um, all animal forms now have an animation for reading a tome, which is hilarious. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't read that. So I, I'm expecting screenshots of bears reading <laughs> in the near future. That's going to be fantastic. Right? Um, the uh, wolf forms had their uh, jump animations polished. Uh, also, all the animal forms had their sit, kneel, and sleep animations polished. Um, weapons and shields should no, should no longer erroneously display well in animal shape under certain conditions, which is always kind of funny. Nice. The, I mean, the floating shield was always kind of amusing. But, um, let's see. Uh, wolf and bear shadow should now appear correctly if you log in with the wild shape already toggled on. Um, they worked on some of the texture make sure and visual stuff. Uh, there's a new toggle feat that druids get at level 13 with their first elemental body pick that disables the textures for elemental forms. Uh, let's see, and some other stuff they did. Um, take down for wolf form. Uh, they increased the cooldown to eight seconds. Uh, it no longer, it now properly grants plus two weapon damage. Uh, the DC scales with the highest of strength, dexterity, or wisdom modifier. That's kind of nice. Uh, Jaws of Winter is now a level six spell, level sort of level seven. Uh, this will require players to memorize it before the update uh, to adjust their memorized spells. Uh, Jaws DC uh, will now also scale with strength, dexterity, or wisdom, whichever is highest. Uh, the wolf, uh, falling wolf spells gain plus one critical damage multiplier and critical threat range. Hey, this is kind of neat. Uh, Baiting bite, Jaws of Winter, and Snow Slide. Well, that'll be great. Uh, in the bear form, tremor damage was increased to two weapon damage and correctly described as attack. Uh, the DC will scale with the higher of, dex of strength or wisdom, so they do not get to use dexterity, which would make sense. Uh, Maul now properly grants plus two weapon damage. Uh, let's see, great maul damage is inc was increased to plus three weapon damage. And the following bear spells gain plus one critical damage multiplier and threat range. Uh, Shred, great maul, and relentless onslaught. Uh, on the spell, uh, well, you, you can't talk about some of the spells earlier. Uh, so the updates for spells. Salt Ray now causes the helpless state when enemies fail their save. That will be nice. I don't even remember that Salt Ray had a save. Um, do you use Salt Ray very much? You know, I, get, I tried that one early on, and then I just I wasn't impressed, so I just brushed it off. But I recently started using it because I saw they were making changes. And I was I was able to use it to stun, you know, un undead trash mobs in R10s, which can be very valuable, you know. So for a very low-cost spell, um, even though the damage isn't impressive, to be able to stun an undead mob uh, was really nice. Undead are notoriously difficult to actually uh, do much with in terms of, Stop, you know, crowd control. Yeah, I mean, think about you get one of those, you know, undead, those uh, the caster skeletons that's a champion. Those things can be really scary yeah. in high skulls, and you can throw a salt ray at them, and boom, they're stunned. And it hits really well. That's uh, good to know. I wrote that off in the very <laughs> early stages of Druid. <laughs> My Druids aren't even like hot max DC casters. You know, they just have decent DCs, and they're hitting well. Undead usually have poor saves anyways, so they're... Their defense is more that you they have very few things that you can affect them with because they, you know, lack a mind and things like that. Um, spike growth had its visual adjusted to reduce the amount of blocks views. Um, I can never pronounce this. Um, shalag? Shalaylee. Shalaylee. I feel like there should be another vowel in there if we're going to call it a shalag. Anyways, uh, the wood staff spell thingy um, is now a self-buff that enhances 
uh, enchants any wooden weapon you wield for its duration, uh, which is kind of neat. Uh, we should see how that plays um, with kind of the changes with melee and, and wolf and bear form. Um, Call Lightning Storm, Storm of Vengeance, and uh, both had their damage adjusted. I could not tell you if that was up or down, uh, but it will up. Is it up? Yes, because yeah. it scales with level now, where before it was a flat damage. Oh, there you go. Might be useful now. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. Actually, I have a <laughs> my pen and paper group. Uh, we have a druid that's been using Call Lightning Storm and has been finding it to be um, lackluster in pen and paper. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, see the feats. Uh, the natural uh, weapon fighting feat ha has double ch strike chance added back in, uh, and the epic feat Master of Wilds now includes the spell Salt Ray. So there you go. Uh, you guys touched a little bit on on druids. Anything else you're like really excited about for the druids? Um, yeah, I'm really excited to see the option to have um, the attack form either be strength or wisdom. It gives you a little more versatility with. Um, with doing a caster druid and still being able to do some damage in a wolf form. So that's nice to see that. Um, the new bear tree looks pretty interesting. Looks like it's going to be a uh, kind of a paladin tree for the druids. Yeah. Actually, I guess I should go through. There's more posts that I didn't go through, too. Um, anything else you want, you want to say generally about druids, uh, Voodoo? Well, I actually want to mention a, a few specific things that I'm really excited about that uh, have been a long time coming. And one is that, like, that creeping colds, you can, they don't conflict with other druids now. Like, if you have multiple druids in the party, they won't overwrite each other's creeping colds. And supposedly, the bug has been fixed where they won't interfere with other uh, arcane casters' uh, Nyax biting cold dot. And I'm really excited about, there's a spell called Elemental Toughness that's being changed. Instead of adding a little bit of DR, it adds uh, PRR, and it stacks with other sources of PR. I'm not sure what the bonus type is. I'm really excited it stacks. It's, it's an additional 20 PR, huge, huge addition to some defensiveness. And I'm also really excited that, and this is kind of a sleeper if you didn't read the notes carefully, there's a spell called Enveloping Swarm, which right now is really lame. It just adds like a little guard around you. It's a neat visual effect. But it just adds, you know, like a one or two, like, poison damage when mobs attack you. But they change it to an acid dot. So now druids get another dot, and it does really good damage. I mean, it's like having a black dragon bolt. So, you know, if you, a druid caster, or if you're interested in druid casters, make sure you don't overlook that one, because it's really awesome. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an a them interesting thematic thing, because... The one of the things I always found really interesting about playing a druid is their healing is over time, right? Like they have vigor and um, regeneration both work over time, so you kind of had to be predictive in your healing as opposed to reactive. Um, so it's interesting that they're, they're also getting a lot of dots uh, as well. Kind of makes for a fun, slightly different play style. Uh, okay, so the Natural Warrior tree, uh, they added 10 exceptional uh, ten exceptional bonus to Double Strike for Howling Frost, which is the Tier 5 um, core. Uh, in Tier 2, uh, Ghost Wolf, which is a just gives you Ghost Touch on your melee attacks while in Wolf form, so that's pretty neat. Uh, Brother Wolf, uh, while your Wolf Pet is alive and within 40 meters, it gains uh, f uh, 5, 10, or 15 hit points every 12, 9, 6 seconds. Uh, and some PRR as well. You also gain uh, up to plus three to hit and damage. Hey, that's fun. It actually makes the, the pet a little more survivable and, and kind of fun, right? And plus, the druid doesn't lose hit points and spell points when the wolf dies anymore. Yes. Which is giant. Yes. Huge quality of life. Everybody's been wanting that forever. So and happy about that. Too. So. I can't say how many times I die due to being in cap when the wolf dies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, I really want. I'm really hoping to see maybe a couple people like actually try to get a wolf or a a wolf pet in there to like tank some things during a raid. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, it'd be hard to do, but it'd be pretty fun. Um, see, tier three, prey on the week. Uh, they now can get up to a 15% damage bonus against helpless creatures. Uh, that's it was moved up from tier two. Uh, Ghost wolf pack. Uh, it's melee attack. Uh, when you trigger the spectral pack, mates appear to assault all foes before you. Uh, on hit, you get plus two weapon damage and a plus two critical threat range. It also applies a five-second confusion effect with no save. 
Uh, that'll be kind of fun. You also gain a 35% incorporeal defense for 20 seconds. Hot diggity. That's pretty good. Uh, tier 5 Throat Rip uh, was changed to a melee attack that strikes three times and adds six sneak attack dice on each attack. Each hit on a living target inflicts a bleed that causes 1d6 damage every three seconds. Keep in mind you're hitting three times. Um, and bleed stacks up to ten times and scales 200% melee power. Uh, they also have to succeed uh, succeed against a fortitude save, uh, which will already be silenced for 15 seconds. <laughs> uh Bosses are immune to the science, but take a 25-point spell power debuff. Yeehaw. And you go for the kill, which is a, a charge uh, attack. It gets plus 4 weapon damage, plus 5 to critical threat range, and plus 1 critical damage multiplier, and you knock them down. There's a save to negate that. Uh, you also grant yourself a plus 15 bonus to melee power for 30 seconds. And if you're charging from a distance of over 10 meters, the melee power bonus is doubled. Uh, it also deals an additional 50 points of damage to helpless targets. Woo. Uh, let's see, in the um, Season Heralds tree, the only change is that they, up, they uh, removed the 17 Druid level requirement for the, uh, the Master of Elements. Which will be nice for those folks. Uh, in the Bear tree, Nature's Protector, um, see, they changed the uh, DC from Big Claws to be the highest of strength or wisdom, and also include tactical bonuses. Uh, the Tremor spell now has a 20% chance to grant you an additional use of Rage. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Uh, they changed the name of the action boost to Beast at Bay, uh, but it didn't change itself. Uh, they moved Savage Ward down to Tier 3 from Tier 4. Uh, they added Constitution uh, to the stats that you can uh, choose. Uh, Bear Unleashed in Tier 5, uh, while raging in any animal form, you get an additional plus 25 melee power. Uh, that's pretty nice. Uh, Bear Charge... Uh, Charge forward, dealing plus two weapon damage and a plus one critical threat range, uh, and damage multiplier to all attack all targets before you. In addition, knock down all enemies that fail a reflex save, uh, and lightning strikes the mountain bear form. Uh, melee attack, which activates to call down a bolt of lightning as you launch an attack. It does plus three weapon damage and five to eight electrical damage per character level, which scales with melee power. You are also granted a hundred percent bonus to melee threat generation and plus twenty MRR for fifteen seconds. Uh, and your those bonuses are doubled if nature's defense is uh, defensive stance is active. There you go. There's all the fun, and then they fixed a ton of bugs, which I'm not going to go through. But we uh, forgot to mention that the uh, reincarnation spell has been changed. The cooldowns now matches the um, raise dead. That is huge. Yeah. Casting speed. Yes. Oh, casting cool speed. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. awesome. Now you don't have to time it just right. It actually makes it better than Raised Dead because um, I think you would get it earlier than Resurrection, right? I believe so. And but it that gives all you depends. Half, I mean... give, but Reincarnate gives you half of your health back. Mm-hmm. So it's like and possibly, possibly some other racial bonuses. <laughs> but also possibly some other racial you know, negatives. Yeah, that that can be kind of dangerous. I was in a party once with uh, one of my party members. Uh, suddenly, was was trying to figure out how come he using silver flame potions was you know causing him to be helpless. It was because he had a minus two penalty to something mm -hmm. <laughs> important from reincarnate. <laughs> pretty funny. Um, so yeah, there you go, druids. Um, it's looking looking pretty good, uh, especially for the melees. I. I'm not sure if I'm going to be playing Wolf or Bear. Part of me really wants to play Bear just because, you know, Bear hasn't really been very good for so long. So I kind of want to play with a Bear. There's also a lot of interesting conversations about because how they're changing what your weapon damage is. Uh, people seem to be gravitating now towards uh, finding really large uh, damage dice weapons. So Maul, I think, are pretty popular right now. Um because the attack speed will be quick, uh, so you, you don't have to worry. It doesn't matter what weapon you're using in terms of attack speed, because your your wolf or your animal form animation is going to drive how fast you attack, as opposed to what kind of weapons you're using. Uh, so you can use quote slower attack weapons without penalty. Um, so that's going to be really interesting to see kind of how people pick their weapons and stuff. 
Although I, I do like my my shield from um, Fire on Thunder Peak. It's kind of a nice shield. But all of my wep all of my druids' weapons are all like one hands to use with a shield. So because I've been using same here, I've been using fighter to get get defensive stance, which I don't need to do anymore. So interesting to see uh, how things kind of shake out for me as well. So I'm looking forward to it a lot. Are you, uh, Anthony, are you, are you leaning more towards bear or wolf? The bear left such a bad taste just being so <laughs> slow to attack. I've got to try it out. Some of right? those those tier trees look so cool. I like that. Just for the flavorful, uh, let's see, what was it? Um, Undying Beast. They basically get, like, Death Ward. <laughs> yeah. There's, uh, there's some fun stuff in there, right? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I will at least, um, be using both of those trees pretty heavily and, and probably going back and forth. The, the question is, which one do I go into tier five? <laughs> exactly. So I definitely see some, uh, now it's time to reincarnate as a druid. Yeah. Give them both a try. Probably, honestly, probably I will go with, um, wolf is tier five just cause most of the stuff that you can get in tier five from bear is somewhat comparable and, to wolf form, and I will probably spend more of my time in wolf than I will in bear. But it will be nice to actually be able to go. Oh, I can uh, I can be the uh, swinging tank bear form. Go! I'm looking forward to that. Definitely. All right. Uh, let's talk about artificers. Uh, artificers got some new uh, some updates as well. Uh, the battle engineer, the shatter defense DC calculation now includes half of your artificer level, as does the thunder shock. Uh, so that'll make those a little bit more effective. Uh, Renegade Mastermaker, uh, Tier 3 and Tier 4 collectively uh, for the cores gained plus 10 to the maximum, ca maximum cash level with admixture spells. Uh, that'll make them pretty handy. Um, this is kind of crazy. Uh, so we had the uh, the mass, un the core 6 was a mass unbreakable force field. Um, now the force field seconds, it's your entire party <laughs> gets 95% less damage. Um, every So you, get, you only use it for 6 seconds for every 3 minutes, but hot Diggity. That's kind of crazy. Um, so that'll be kind of fun. That'll be really helpful in raids, I think. You know, you get some of those those points where people start taking lots of damage or there's, um, you know, there's special attacks and stuff. Uh, you can make everyone take 95% less damage for six seconds. That's huge. Um, easily fixed was changed to 10 healing amp and 20 repair amp. That's kind of fun. Uh, Mighty Slam is a uh, their new... Uh, melee attack in tier two, which is a stun, uh, a, a stun attack. Um, in tier three, you get battle fist, uh, which is <laughs> this is the one that they're showing the new, the new attack animation. Uh, so if the target is under the effect of mighty slam stun, uh, you knock it down, uh, and the attack animation looks like it's something out of a wrestling move. <laughs> it's they have it on um, on the main or on uh, the forums. You can check it out. Uh, Steel Star posted a video of it, and it's pretty slick. It that alone almost makes me want to play a melee artificer. Uh, shielding construct: uh, you create a construct that shields you and your allies. Uh, it's like it gets everyone the shield spell for two minutes. Um, some people were, were I thought this was kind of uh, amusing in that some people were were saying a, a mass shield spell for only two minutes. Come on, that's kind of lame. Uh, and uh, Steel Star's response was, uh, "It seems to us like it would be pretty effective." given uh, that people are being killed by magic missiles from Wisps in Ravenloft. Yeah, I was going to say, that's pretty big. <laughs> that's pretty nice. That's a pretty compelling argument, I must say. Um, so, uh, let's see. Warding Construct. Uh, so this is a drone to counter magical uh, spells. Every 10 seconds, you and your allies get a plus three alchemical bonus to saving throws uh, uh, for magic and traps. Uh the construct and its effects last indefinitely until this build by relogging death or anti magic, so that's kinda nice. Well I'm not sure why anti magic would, would affect a drone, but you know, whatever. Uh tier five, they, they changed the force field to be multi selector, so there's unbreakable force fields. So for six seconds, uh your target takes ninety five percent uh damage or ninety five percent less damage from all sources, except unhyped. Uh, or there's reactive force field. Uh when you drop below fifty percent you gain the effects of unbreakable force field for six seconds. Uh, it has a 90-second cooldown. 
this is a separate cooldown from the one from the core. But that's kind of interesting that you can choose to just have it work on yourself and reactively, uh, and the, the cooldown is half as much. So it's kind of nice. Uh, I can I can see now there could be an, there's an interesting opportunity to have a tank here with a uh, a battle uh, renegade uh, master maker, uh, and then also splash a couple levels into um, the sorcerer or wizard, and then get the eldritch knight that also has a reactive <laughs> shield. I don't know if it has the same cooldown or not. Um, but uh, you could get some interesting stuff going on there. Although they'd probably both uh, trigger at the same time, so you may not get as much benefit. Uh, and then they adjusted the um, the repair R. They made it um, last indefinitely in until dispelled by relogging death or anti magic. So that's kind of neat. It's an interesting tree. Not, I don't know if I'll actually play it, but um, I'll definitely give it a shot from one time just to check it out. Um, I've never been a fan of the, the throwing the curatives. I do think it's funny when someone's in capped and they just jump up after being uh, hit with a bottle of potion bottle. <laughs> I mean, it can be effective, and it's it's definitely not a, a pr primary focus for my uh, artificer, but you know, I I have been a healer at times and been pressed into service for one reason or another, and it's I mean they're pretty effective now. I mean, you're adding a whole bunch of... You're adding 10 catch levels to it, so it'll be quite more effective as well. I oh, love yeah. when Artie's th are throwing drinks. I've, I, you know, we... <laughs> Artie's in my Reaper groups do it all the time. You know, a couple of party members, one watching right now, actually. And uh, it's really helpful. I love it. It's a fun animation, just in general, too, so... Uh, let's see. Other fun stuff. We should mention... Um, the adventure pack is Disciple of Rage, um, five new dungeons. Um, let's see, the it's in House J. Didn't really give a. I didn't run. The, I didn't go on Lumenian and run them, uh, and they don't really give much of a um, much of a description of what they are. Um, but there will be a kind of an intro quest, and then three quests, and then a cap that you can do in any order, and then uh, the capstone. I want to give the dev props here. You know, aside from Ravenloft, you know the the updates on either side of it, five quests. If you think about mm -hmm. compared to what we've had before that, we were getting like one, two, or three. Probably because they're working really hard on Ravenloft. <laughs> well, even before though, I mean, five is really yeah. five quests and an update is really awesome. So, thumbs up. I mean, I haven't played the quest, but I think it's awesome. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, there'll be level 14 in heroic and level 31 in legendary. Not happy about the heroic fourteen. I mean, we've got yeah. giant hold. Mm -hmm. We've got you know orchard. There's so much XP there. So not crazy about that choice. Uh, I, I, I think I, part of that probably has to do that. with um, Ravenloft was ten, eleven, twelve, and then went to fourteen. The other yeah. thing that's kind of annoying, um, particularly if I have a character that I know I'm going to park at cap for a long time. I try. I really try not to run stuff that you would run in in epic. Or you can run in epics and heroics, uh, and basically every level fourteen quest is <laughs> that's heroic is available in epic. So kind of a little bit of a hole. That, Although that, that is that, true. That is a really good point. I have absolutely no desire for them to only create quests for a heroic level. That would be ridiculously silly. But it is kind of a, an interesting little fluke of the level ranger. Everything else around it. Uh, you can kind of get a, you get around that, but level fourteen. I think the only one is, um, I think Reaver's Fate is level fourteen, but that's a raid, so <laughs> it doesn't really count. Uh, Gives you more reason to save a uh, giant hold for the higher levels. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we also got to look at update thirty eight uh, loot. Um, there's, I think there's some tweaking going on, and I'm not going to go through everything, but I wanted to. Is there anything you guys uh, wanted to mention specifically? I really like the stuff that's usable by druids. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a nice couple of nice caster uh, sticks, a couple of sickles. There are set bones, and then, too. Yeah, and there's a new set of green dragon armor called Scales of Exile. And there's a, a new shield. I think it's called the Giant's Platter. And... The shield and armor combination, there's a set bonus there. That's actually going to finally make me give up my Shadow Dragon, Shadow Guardian armor, 
and the Bethic Runestone. Uh, there's big defense there for my tanky caster druid, so uh, really happy that we got some some new druid stuff there. Did you not? Um, you didn't pick up the ones out of uh, Tempest Spine or how does Uh The the armors there. There was no heavy armor that a druid could wear out of those raids, and I'm a heavy armor wearer. It was just scale, was which is a medium. Right. There were some nice medium armors out of there for sure. So if you're a medium armor caster druid, which is more traditional, then yeah, those were great. And then the shield i would have probably loved the like celestial oak for example but it was a small shield and i really want to use a large shield yeah that's it's a really good point that the this stuff here is um much more it's much more for like heavy set right because you got the heavy armor a large shield um both of which are, are giving some some really nice bonuses to a lot of useful things so i mean insightful wisdom and constitution nine on the armor is I mean, that's right up every druid's alley. It's right up my, my clerk's, alley, My yeah. cleric's going to mug someone for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. yeah. uh, I'll add, um, I, I think they did a really good job with like the flavorful items. They seem really cool. Um, as a Pale Master, I'm definitely going for that Curse Keeper trinket and the Curse Skull Orb. Sure. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, there's uh, some nice stuff Uh Nice stuff there for, I would say, some of the um, lesser served um, builds and stuff. I mean, some of the weapons, there's there's a light pick and a club in there, um, which is kind of <laughs> different. Um, although, I, I haven't seen the effect, the, the graphic yet, but if the Lilting Song, which is a club that uh, just reads like a bard's wet dream, uh, is not mm -hmm. some sort of, like, instrument, I'm going to be really disappointed. <laughs> I feel like that needs to be something musical, um, graphic wise. But that would be I think really it cool. will be. Yeah. If not, I'm gonna uh, mirror it to the Mad Loot. Yeah, right. Uh, there are also a lot of helms uh, in this uh, update. Uh, there's actually there's literally a uh, helm for every stat, <laughs> um, with things that you would think would would kind of more or less go with those. Um, but of course, still everyone was you know kind of. I did kind of thought, think you you uh, made a suggestion, Voodoo, of of letting the the helms be um, like you could pick your stat, uh, which would be kind you of you saw fun. that, I huh? Did. I did that, see that you know that was inspired by the fact that when they first added this, the charisma helm was mislabeled as wisdom, and I saw that and I was like, oh my god, I want that. <laughs> It's amazing. That's exactly what I need. And they're like, oh, this was supposed to be charisma. And I'm like, no. And I was like, you know what? Here's a crazy idea. Why don't you leave the stat block blank and let us upgrade it to whatever stat we want? Like, that would be so cool. It would be. Um, we should mention that, nice. that all of the loot is, um, or not all of the loot, but mo the helms and, and much of the much of the stuff is, um, you can upgrade it with, the uh, the trace of madness stuff from the altar of insanity, which I think is is the stuff out of um, some of the previous uh, packs, right? It was a really interesting choice for them to do. Yeah. So that'll <laughs> be kind of. Fun. And they said yeah. there's not. I specifically asked, and they said there's not going to be a legendary version of that upgrade. <laughs> You're just adding the heroic upgrades to it. So some of them are. Com from what I understand, there's a completely moot by the time you get to legendary, but some of them could be kind of interesting. So, um, my understanding I mean, is they did this from a thematic standpoint, not a um, like we're using this to, to balance the items standpoint. That was kind of the the impression I got from what they were saying. Okay, that's fair, fair enough. Yeah. So, are they upgrading them off new materials or the the same ones from the Madness Chain? Same ones, I think. I it's it's the same process to upgrade it. Yeah. Same. Oh jeez, <laughs> got a ton of that stuff. <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm curious. I don't even. I've never used like the the guards from their upgrade. I'm curious. Like, there's a displacement guard. Like, how often does that proc? I have no idea, but that could be interesting. It procs pretty often. I actually have that armor on my um, my wolf pet. Well, I know what upgrade I'm getting. I don't. The the problem. I you may not be able to do it on that armor because um, I think that. It's a little hard to tell based on how they format it, but it, it looks like not yes. everything can be. 
but you can put it on your helm. So. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to use that helm. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, that bums me out. No, there's, there's some interesting stuff in here. Uh, I think it's definitely kind of a horizontal. It's not, for mo- in most cases, it's a, kind of a horizontal movement. I think the the heavy armor in terms of like being usable by druids is kind of a, a vertical progression. Because um, I don't, I can't think of the, like I said, Thunderforge maybe the last time they had a, a decent heavy armor that they could use. Um, and there's some, the Necromancer set you, you mentioned, it looks pretty nice. Um, there's a weapon set kind of specifically geared towards um, the Scourge Asimar, because it's two heavy maces. Uh, has some stuff going on there. And then the helms, which, you know, we didn't get any helms with Ravenloft, so uh, that fits in pretty nicely there. Although I would also say most of the stuff that's that's in that uh, selection of helms is generally kind of already available. Um, but uh, there's some there's some good stuff in there still. So uh, yeah, um, we should also do want to mention there is a new filigree set, um, the city's beacon filigree set, uh, which actually looks pretty decent. Um, so your your melee strikes if you get all four. Um, your melee strikes have a chance to give you uh, plus 20 MRR, plus 20 PRR, and displacement uh, for 10 seconds each, uh, all kind of on their own thing. It's also uh, worth noting that uh, the new sentient filigrees uh, will have a chance to drop in all places other than uh, that other filigrees can drop. Uh, so that means Ravenloft uh, and Update 38. So what's going to happen is any, all of the Ravenloft chests and all the Update 38 chests will still be able, you'll be able to find all of the filigrees that are available in those chests. Uh, that does mean uh, that, so your chances of finding a filigree is unchanged, but your chances of finding a certain individual filigree will go down slightly just because there's more filigrees in the pool. Um, some other notes that I wanted to mention uh, that Steel Star said about uh, loot. Uh, he said he'd love to fill out lower epic and lower heroic uh, loot. Uh, there's some big gaps so that aren't uh, any name versions of certain things, uh, but it really depends on the content's needs. However, they can hopefully fill in some of those ranges soon. Um, craftable rune arms uh, is probably likely a seri- uh, something of the past, uh, mostly because they tend to break the entire can- cr- crafting system several times over. Um, and he also said they, they, they understand that having red or red adjacent slots on non-weapon slots is desirable, but major sy- changes to the system would be needed for that. Uh, there you go. Uh, let's see. Bonus days, you get uh, double Mysterious Remnants uh, through today. Uh, champions have twice the chance to drop Remnants. Uh, store news, you can get a boost. It's 20% off of Sovereign XP Elixirs, Treasure Hunter Elixirs, Creator Slayer Boosts, and Long Lasting Ability Potions. Uh, you can also get a free Enchanted Repair All Kit uh, with the coupon code Repair All Kit. They are fantastic things. I I always leave in my bank and then run something like a, a really hard raid or something and get our butts kicked and think, man, I would really like to have one of those repair kits that's in my bank right now to repair my stuff. <laughs> right there with you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's kind of that'll be kind of fun. Uh, anyways, uh. Talk about community news. Uh, we have two Chronicle Kills to get to uh, since I took a week off. Um, so this is a 276 Chronicle. That would be the one from the last week. Um, Axel extols the virtues of the Shroud. Uh, a group of friends on Kyber. Uh, this was I was actually a member of my guild. Um, or She was partly in my guild and had another guild as well, I think. Uh, but uh, someone fell, uh, passed away uh, suddenly. Uh, so they had... Uh, held a, a large public raiding event, um, had several iterations of Fall of Truth, uh, which is one of her favorite raids, uh, as well as Temple of Deathworm. Uh, so it was a really nice tribute to her. Uh, City wrote about Strimtom's Acid Arrow build. Uh, Maze Arcana started a new Eberron-themed tabletop uh, on Wednesday evenings, uh, the Inkwell Society. Uh, the guild uh, is Hagakur, a small guild with the largest airship, an XP shrine, buffs, uh, a Kenneth Crafter, and more. It's a Kyber-based guild looking for powerful characters to join them, but it's also looking for anyone interested in improving their skills. Uh, let's see. The comment for the week, if you uh, had to put explorer points around your yard, what object would you use to click on? 
is it bad if I say weeds? <laughs> it's honest, so. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Fansite News. Uh, we got a shout-out for our, our show looking at Endgame uh, Part 2. Uh, DDO Players News discussed the Mimic Hunt and more. The Damsel of DDO found Feather Keepers. Uh, Batch Lagora ran Giant Hold. McKee was in Ravenloft. Draculetta was at level 7. Uh, DDO PL took an arrow to the knee uh, in their Polish language live stream. Uh, McVegan Pants ran Sentin- Sentinels of Stormreach, even though it ran Heroic Abic. Uh Doug ran, asked Mimic quest questions for Bard Life. Brock and Friends uh, bring, bring, brings, brung the role play to DDO. Uh, Brighter Days Ahead streams every Thursday night. Uh, a very bad guild discovered a new music channel. Uh, Tony's Fishing, Gaming, and Guitars has Halfling Rogue Adventures. I feel like with a title like that, it needs to be playing a bard with the mad loot. Um, see, Sip wrote about the prisoners. Uh, the Quest of the Prisoner. That'd be Bond 2. Uh, let's see, Cordovan on uh, the weekly Wednesday lunchtime live stream uh, showed why Ariston from is for Mimics. Uh, great place to go if you're looking for Mimics. Uh, the 277th Chronicle, Titus Ovid, created a German language Discord server for DDO players. Uh, pretty neat. Uh, the Hylogen of Muck here, you guys have a um, hide and seek event. You want to take a moment to talk about that? Yeah, that is today. So if you're watching live, uh, it's going to be on Sarlona in the harbor at 2 p.m. Eastern, so about two hours from now. And I'm going to be hosting about an hour of hide-and-seek, so I'm going to be hiding all around the harbor and posting in general chat clues to find me. And whoever's the first one to find me wins a prize. And then after hide-and-seek, I'm going to be doing some trivia. Uh, Again, it'll all be in general chat. I'll be posting the trivia uh, questions in general chat. And uh, be giving out lots of prizes and some uh, could be some good ones in there. Uh, Shrimp Tom went to Lemania for testing and more. Uh, you can check out his video there. Uh, the Guild for the Week is a French language guild on Salona looking for people to join them. Uh, I'm going to attempt to pronounce this, uh, but I have no knowledge of French other than it's a language. Uh, I think it's Chevaliers du Lys. Um, you can find Tortu in game to join level 200 guild. Uh, the comment for the week is, what is the most iconic location for you in Stormreach? Like That's it's... easy. Statue with the light? Yeah, which I didn't know is apparently called the Emperor until the Update 38 release notes, which talks about that statue. Does it? I didn't even realize it was Yeah, it says notes. it's <laughs> called the Emperor. Probably the Inspired Quarter, since uh, when I started playing, that's where we started out. That's fair. Um, the statue was just so it really draws your eye and it was on all of the um, the screenshot stuff of the harbor right so mm-hmm. let's see fansite news Dito players went off the rails in episode 172 um, we got a shout out for Dito Kasplat uh, Dreaming of Jeets um, <laughs> a lot of fun uh, Fumbles and Fame went into DDO uh, Mickey ran against the clock Sip wrote about Haywire's Foundry uh, DDOPL rode the XP train, McVegan Pants found, finds a prisoner and more. Even is fear immune but timid in the latest stream with Even. Bard Life uh, had trivia. Brock and Friends uh, was doing role-playing on Friday still. Uh, Brighter Days Ahead uh, sounded like a chipmunk. That's kind of cr- strange. Uh, Tone Station returned to Giant Hold. Samus Grobo features a complete barbarian life on YouTube. Uh, so you can check out that playlist. City wrote about the early arcane ad- uh, Acid Arcane Archer. Batch the Gore spends Friday on Ice. Very Bad Guild uh, found product placement in Fathom of the Depths. Uh, Tito LP uh, got black and blue. And Melissa and John have started streaming DDO on Twitch and YouTube. Welcome to the family. There's a lot of a lot of streamers still, uh, which is pretty stinking awesome. Um, Doug is saying the Bank of Kondrarik is a pretty prominent location for him, and Mystic Dragon Rider is... The Oops Teleport. <laughs> yeah. It's a nice view. Uh, let's see. Uh, other stuff uh, going on. Uh, Axel had a video uh, talking about uh, Cleric Enhancement Pass, some ideas for that. Uh, Voodoo, you had a video uh, on how Legendary Green Steel bonus, set bonuses work. Yeah, so that's a, that's something that it, you know was really confusing to me, and I know there's a lot, a lot of people out there that you know when you get to the two, four, and five piece set bonuses, it was confusing. Like, how do you get? 
How do you craft to that? How does it work? And so I went over all of that. Uh, unfortunately, I had the wrong settings when I was doing the live stream, and so the video quality is pretty bad. Um, the information is there, so it's totally you know usable. If you are interested in how set bonuses work, like I encourage you to check it out. I will be redoing that video when Lamania is open again. That might not be for a couple months, but you know I kind of want to wait till Lamania is open because I can use my green steel ingredients there without actually using them up. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was a uh, uh, pretty clever <laughs> use of um, <laughs> of Lamania there. To, good, good time to do that video for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, you also did teaching raids last night, which was Tempest Spine and Mark of Death, I believe. Yeah, and I kind of feel bad too because we kind of power marched the new folks through Legendary Elite <laughs> Tempest Spine, and they died a lot. So hopefully this do. morning. They're not feeling too bruised, and they're happy that they got the, you know, all the loot and the and all the favor. I mean, it's we'll see. it's traditional to teach people legendary T tempest spine just in general by like dragging them by their feet through the whole thing on this mad dash, isn't it? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if they come back next week. <laughs> what are you doing next week? I haven't decided yet, but um, we're we're finishing up the first half of this of the 2018 season, and the ones I have left to do are Heroic Abbot and Master Art of Seren Lord of Blades. So it'll probably be one of those two events. Uh, let's see, other stuff uh, going on. Tamsin's video had their 86 episode. Um, the uh, bio break I had a blog on Made to Order uh, and. Mickey's Lyrium was running against the clock. Uh, some fun stuff there. Uh, and pretty much rounds out the community news. Uh, Dude, because Plant is still going. There's going to be at least a short break coming up for Dido Kasplat. Maybe we'll call it a mid-season break before a little bit longer of a break. Um, but we'll, we'll keep going. We'll be back. Um, but there might be some more weeks off uh, as we get into kind of a busier season for some of us. Uh, but we are still having fun. It, it's <laughs> it was funny last week we were running two skulls in inspired quarter and it felt like we were just cruising through it. And then we ran three skull shipwreck spy on three skulls and got a champion assassin and he just mowed us down. <laughs> it was oh wow! Cool. He just went through us like butter. It was hilarious. Uh, so all right, uh, there's no lightning post this week, uh, and we're kind of running a little bit long. I want to so we're just gonna close up the show. Uh, so, uh, Antha, anything you want to plug before we head out? Uh, nothing to plug this week. All right. Uh, Voodoo, I, we've already plugged you a few times. Uh, anything else to mention? Yeah, since we talked about uh, druids earlier, I did a video on Lamania uh, talking about showing the new enhancement trees, talking about some of those enhancements, and demonstrating some of the spells and talking about some of the other changes. Again, my my video settings were still wrong at that point, so the quality isn't very good. But if you are a fan of Caster Druids and you want to uh, dig in a little bit more than we talked about here today and see some some demonstrations of that stuff, then uh, you can check that out. The channel is Voodoo Spice. Uh, Voodoo with a U, Space, Spice with a Y. All right, so thanks for Voodoo and Anthony for joining me today. And thanks to all the contributors for DDOcast. Uh, there's a bunch of folks who really helped make this show happen. And thanks to all our listeners. Uh, otherwise, we'd just be talking into the void if we didn't have anyone listening. So we really appreciate uh, the listeners, especially those in the chat room today. Uh, and thanks to Sandy Stone Games and to Wizards of the Coast and to Cyberers for making all of this possible. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, you can visit our website, ditocast.com, uh, or you can support us on Patreon. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of work on the website, trying to get some stuff updated. Uh, but if you have a DDO themed web page or you Twitch DDO and you'd like to be featured on our website, uh, you can email me at ddocast.com and we'll get that to happen. Uh, you can also hit us up at ddocast.com for our show notes, MP3s, our calendar, previous shows, uh, and other fun stuff. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of the show, if you have a comment on this episode, maybe there's a question you'd like to hear us answer or a topic you'd like to hear us discuss. Or you just want to say hi, you can leave a comment or you can email us at dedocast uh, at gmail.com. Uh, our closing tip for the week comes from Helena on Kyber. Uh, read the forums for help. Uh, so stay tuned for part three of four of our uh, endgame then and now discussion. Uh, but first, uh, we have uh, an episode of Greetings from Corthos.
Greetings from Corthos. Today I would like to talk about the process I used in setting up a greeter character and some thoughts on things I saw along the way. First, it's been a bit since the last episode, so uh, what has been happening in-game? Let me start with some cool stuff uh, that uh, has happened in-gameplay. I have been collecting filigrees from Ravenloft and suffering under the overwhelming burden of bank space limitations. I did get into trading some and uh, had a great uh, trade with hunters. Uh, thanks for the trade hunters and I think I owe you one there. I say uh, any more trading between characters in game is great. Patrick uh, mentioned in one of the previous DDO casts how switching servers and trading cards during the 10th anniversary event was a great memory. I never went quite that far, but any trading between players on your main server or other servers can add uh, a great interactive element to gameplay. I actually had a chance to do uh, some raid runs with Mickey yesterday, and I have to say the runs were very smooth, and she has become quite good at keeping the group on track. It's been a few months since uh, I had the chance, actually, uh, because of time difference. But uh, even riding out the storm, a raid that I had tried when it first came out, uh, but uh, since it was uh, not finishable at the time, and for whatever other reasons, I, I never ran it since. Uh, and we completed it no problem at all. Well, relatively. If you do have a regular raiding uh, pug group uh, on your server and uh, do it for as long as Mickey has, people join right away. We were running full groups the whole time. I did a run with Elizabeth of the Guild Crusade during the anniversary event, and she said that uh, she would be taking a break for a while. After some more discussion, she said that uh, she would be having a baby very soon. We don't know... Uh, who we're playing with a lot of the time, where they are, what's up in people's real lives, but it's pretty cool uh, that you can be actively running through quests when you might not be too mobile yourself. Congratulations to Elizabeth, good luck with everything, and hope to see you back soon. Besides that, it's impressive to see the community activity happening recently, lots of live streams, the Ravenloft fan video event was great, and uh, the brand new German Discord channel is populating nicely. Good work to Titus Ovid and the others involved in that, and it would be great to see Discord channels for other languages. There are good populations of Portuguese, French, Spanish, and Italian speakers, among other languages, and Discord is a great way to get in contact with others across all servers in your own language. If you are a regular listener of the DDOcast, you have heard some excellent new commercials of late. Among the great talent that has helped out, I think I even heard a Clankenbeard in there. The return of Clankenbeard. I'm going to say this now, but for future sentient gems, I would love to see a Clankenbeard voice on one. Clankenbeard sentient gem. Make it so. Well, I guess we'd have to talk to Clank and Beard about this, but come on. Okay, on to the main topic. How did I set up the Corthos Greeter character? I've said it before, it's not necessary to make a Greeter character or follow any formula, but maybe some of the stuff I talk about here will get you thinking about other things that you want to try. This discussion has been a little tough to put into words as it deals with methods of gameplay that may not be as intended by the devs. I mean, the expected approach to the game is to play the game by running through quests, not by standing around all day. So I will go over some parts roughly and leave other parts up to you if you want to explore further. So, first thing is uh, to get started with an alt. If you are a VIP player, then you're going to have plenty of them. Set up the character as you like and run it through the introductory quest. Remember that Corthos is divided into two meta instances, I guess you could say. One snowy, one sunny. Brand new players will have no idea about what or why this is, but in order to interact directly with the newest players, you are going to want to keep your character 
Corinthians in uh, snowy Corthos and not leave uh, to the harbor at all because when you return you will be in sunny Corthos and uh, for the most part that is the area generally used by players who are more familiar with the game. They've made the trip to harbor, check the bank, pick up what they need and come back for the quest for the most part. I have two characters which I keep in Corthos. I keep Velcom in uh, Sunny Corthos and Visit Harbor in Snowy Corthos for the characters' full names as well as some fancy screenshots. Check the uh, Corthos Greeter forum thread for more. I use the term meta instance for Snowy and Sunny Corthos because there are a whole set of instances interconnected uh, for each one. They include Corthos Village, the Corthos Wilderness Area, the tavern and all of the quests along the way. Both Sunny and Snowy Corthos are connected through general chat, so you can communicate between meta instances, but may not be able to meet the other person who you're communicating with unless one of you leave Snowy Corthos to the harbor. This is perhaps the most heart-wrenching experience in Corthos, where someone may be trying to find their loved one uh, who is in the other meta instance and can't find them. I'll discuss this further in future episodes, uh, but let's just say for now, it's an obstacle you're going to have to deal with. The nice thing about the chat is that if you want to send out a message, everyone is going to hear it, uh, which is great. The caveat is that if you contact someone who is in Snowy Corthos while you're in Sunny, you will have to explain this technical part of the game before you can do any further activity together. There is no problem with messages, however, and I have compiled about 15 messages which I would send out periodically in general chat. Uh, I've added them to the Corthos Greeter thread, so you can see them there. In the last while, though, uh, I've been using three messages most regularly. I will send out two from Velcom, letting people know uh, how to access guilds and where to find LFMs. And the third message I will send with Visit Harbor about going to Harbor and uh, getting your bank uh, access to your bank, mail or higher level hirelings. And then you can always come back to Sunny Corthos later. It is a bit of an art to send out messages in chat and I've tailored the content several times so it's not too much of a bother in gameplay. Uh, that's one thing I learned pretty quick and I think uh, this is something for guild recruiters also you're not going to get a good response by spamming chat. Uh, I found that maybe once an hour was appropriate in busy times, like on weekends or uh, evenings for the Americas, and in off hours, uh, an even lower frequency is good. Nowadays, I'll do maybe two or three comments a day just to get some information out there. Beyond that, I would interact with players, if I saw someone running around the main Corthos village clearing, I would send them a wave or a salute emote. From time to time, uh, if there was a question in chat and the person was still around, or uh, it was generally a useful question uh, to have an answer to, I would answer uh, that question in chat. If I wasn't busy, sometimes this would even lead to discussions as well. If there was a veteran player doing some activity in Corthos or running a group, I'd let people know how to join the LFM. It's always good to see other people getting in there and helping out by answering questions, and if there was anything to add to the conversation, or if there were some questions, uh, I'd sometimes add to discussion. I even led people to Valeria to get to Harbor to uh, meet a friend uh, and had the odd dance party in Corthos as well. You can find some of the party photos in the Corthos Greeter thread. Priority for me is manageability and longevity, I guess. I want to do something that's helpful but isn't going to put me too out of my way with my own gameplay. Whatever you want to do, I think it shouldn't be done to frustration. If it's too much or not enjoyable, well, that goes against the basics of why we're all here. To enjoy yourself and have a little fun. At the very least, having a presence in Corthos may be a, a new player's first interaction with other players in the game. By having a window on Corthos open on my computer, 
uh, I've been able to see what kind of conversations are going on and what questions are being asked. With a character on standby, I could check back on discussions uh, while I've been at work or when I got, get up in the morning. I would be able to see how long it had been since my last message, so I wasn't posting too often. And by adding people as friends, I got to see uh, who was spending more time in Korthos and what they were doing. It also has been nice to keep an eye out for LFMs that pop up for a quest that I want to run with my main characters. I will have more information on Korthos Greeter activities in upcoming editions. And uh, if you do have any questions about what I've talked about today, please feel free to contact me in the forums under Grander and Marn. Even though Korthos is more and more a bypassed village on the reincarnation superhighway, consciously doing something while in Korthos lets new players know that there is more out there. Uh, it is, after all, the point where we all started playing DDO. If you are a relatively new player, a veteran, VIP, or even Warforged. Until next time, take care. Welcome. We are talking today, continuing our discussion about Endgame, then and now. Uh, we've talked about then, we've talked about now. Now we're going to talk about why, essentially. Uh, I'm your host, Patrick. Uh, with me this week, we have our guest returning for this, uh, Asheris. Say hi, Asheris. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, there we go. Uh, Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh, we also have Warcane. Hello. Great. Uh, so, like I said, so last time we were talking about what Endgame looks like now. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to be talking about what are some specific things that have changed what Endgame looks like. Uh, so take it away, Ashers. All right. Well, some of these things are things we've already introduced in the previous two segments. So quick plug, if you haven't watched, listened to those yet, please do. Um, hope you enjoy them. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the first things we want to talk about that uh, have changed Endgame is, uh, is reincarnation. Um, so we talked earlier about reincarnation in terms of, you know, how we use it, how it, how it looks, what it does. Um, how do you guys feel though, sp specifically about how reincarnation has impacted end game? I think there's two things that stand out to me. One is it's prolonged the life of the game, right? Like it, it gives you more end game. So, and I think that's kept players in the game. Um, the other thing is it really encourages you to focus on fewer characters, which will kind of be a theme <laughs> here. Um, it gives you more to do with that one character or one or three characters, right? So people tend to, you get more focused. Um, and I think it's one of the major reasons why you look at where Endgame was and where Endgame is, and you went from a standpoint where you could probably reasonably estimate that most players had somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to ten characters to where a lot of players are really functionally have one to three characters that they're really focusing on. I feel that uh, reincarnation has helped the uh, game and as a whole. Um, probably not so much for you guys, but for me being Orion and it being the default server for as long as it was, when I TR and go back to one, I find I'm in groups with people that are new to the game, so I help them. And there's not a lot of games. I mean, if they didn't have reincarnation and you're new, you ain't going to have a guy who already been through all this playing with you to help you, to show you where quests are, to tell you what you need to do, tell you where you need to go, show them, teach them. So that brings in new players and helps them, I feel, keep the game going. I, I, that's a really great point. You know, um, back in uh, the Shroud days, for example, um, you know, I had eight, eight or so characters, all of whom were capped, and I was running endgame content. And I would occasionally go back and fire up a new character just for the heck of it. But um, for the most part, you know, I wasn't uh, playing levels, you know, one through 12 very much. And I remember when Reincarnation first came out, it was you know very exciting and interesting to take these characters i've been playing for years and bring them back through that content that they had been through 
you know, a long time ago. And there's still a little bit of fun to that in some cases, especially as they progress. Um, what, what do you guys feel about the, um, the concept that's been floated that, uh, all the reincarnations make it difficult for, uh, SSG to design content that is challenging for the newer players, as well as the heavily reincarnated players. And, um, what some folks will refer to as the grind wall that can exist. I think when you add in the discussion about Reaper and skulls and stuff, it kind of becomes a moot point because there's a lot more variance in difficulty level now. Um, okay. But I would also say that to a certain extent, sure. Um, obviously, if you have all that stuff invested, you're going to be a more a stronger character. On the other side of things, you know, you look at the... Just take as an example the heroic lives. Racial lives are, are pretty generally useful for everyone. You know, you get extra action points, and that's a, a bigger bump. But look at some of the heroic lives. Depending on your build, um, it'll well, it kind of depends on which ones they are. But any given build, you're probably not going to be using like half of those past lives effectively, anyways. So, sure. Like if your end build is a melee character, the spell penetration from wizard probably not doing you a whole lot of good. No, absolutely. I agree. You're right. There's a lot, you know, and the, the ones that have the sorcerer extra evocation DCs probably not helping you too much. Sure. There's a couple of them you could argue don't help with any build. Yeah. Uh, that's another, <laughs> that's another topic entirely. Fair. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's move to, um, before we jump off of reincarnation, I think there's one yeah. thing to, to say too. Um, like Warcane was kind of pointing out that, you know, you can go back and interact with newer players that can be a positive or a problem, right? Because there's Agreed. definitely definitely a group of po people that play the game, and um, oh, hey, there's a group I can play with these guys, and then they they zerg through the quest, and the the new players left at the back, like, what just happened? That wasn't fun, <laughs> or they get yelled at because you know the, the people zerging through, or they're, they're, they, that person's slowing them down. So there's there's a danger there too. Um, I don't think that's an issue with reincarnation specifically. I think that that's a people problem. Um, just as, as it's an opportunity to interact with new players and pull them into the game, it's an opportunity to drive them away. So it's it's kind of something to think about. Sure. Okay. Um, what about, uh, let's move on to raid timers and how they have changed in game. Um, a lot, working. actually. <laughs> working, what do you think about raid timers? Um... I don't find I use a terrible lot of them. It's nice to have. You run it later on that night. A couple of friends come on. They're running it. and You want to play with them. You can. So with, with that aspect of it, I do like them. Do they affect the end game as far as raid goes? It, it depends on the, the person. I mean, you can sit there and just eat a bunch of them, keep doing it. And yeah, you're going to get burned out on it. So... Again, that's situational in my opinion, but I think raid timers have had a major impact in the game, but you can't just look at raid timers specifically. Um the reason I say that is that I'll use Mark of Death as kind of my um example or reasoning. Mark of Death had such low drop rates for the items that people pretty quickly just said, Okay, well I just need to run twenty runs so that I can get what I want. And that's how it's gonna be. Um, yeah. and so what happens is, oh, well, there's these raid timers now, and because of a confluence of events that I don't really want to get into, you know, it was not uncommon for people to say, all right, 20 runs, here we go, or 10 runs at a time, right? And you didn't care that the chest was ransacked and the chest wouldn't drop you a name loot because you had already accepted the fact that you weren't going to get name loot out of this chest. Um, getting name loot out of it was... An, an amazingly rare event, right? Um, so because of how low your chances were, you didn't care that you were ransacked. So you didn't care that you would run it 20 times in a sitting if you could stomach that. No thanks, I would say. But um, there are people that are doing that. Um, and I think the biggest thing that that does is it doesn't just shorten the lifespan of the raid for those players. It interrupts the generational 
lifespan of the of the raid, right? So what was happening was you'd get the front runners that would run the raids, uh, and you know maybe they would finish getting what they needed needed or wanted to get. Um, but you know as as some of the front runners were were kind of quote done with the raid and running it less and less, you had that that next generation coming in, learning from them and running the raid, and then you would get another generation in behind them. So you would get you could get three, four, or five generations on any given raid. Uh, as long as other events like new content or new items um, or at least having decent items. There's some raids, um, Titan and um, RSO kind of jump out as there, there were other things that were kind of inhibiting people getting into those raids like racial reincarnation coming out or the mechanics were kind of difficult to figure out or people just didn't like them. Um, but you take all that other stuff out of there and you went from this culture of having four, five, maybe even six, quote, generations of people running the raids to each new generation had to kind of figure it out on their own, which I think really, because there's not people, that first generation is not teaching the second generation how to do the raid and have success at it, you know, the those generations maybe were probably less likely to have people that are really interested in really figuring out the raid and learning how to make the raid work and make it easier for themselves. They just wanted to run the raid and have a good time and make and have it be fairly easy. There's nothing wrong with that, but you take that generational teaching out of it and suddenly your life your raid life span dwindles very quickly. I agree. Uh yeah, I think raid timers you, you talked about the event aspect of raids and I think raid timers also damaged that to a little bit. You know, it, it turned raid timer it turned a raid like Mark of Death into a grind window farm on Shadow Crypt. Yeah. Um, you know, um, which is, you know, something that you kind of expect or accept as part of the most efficient way to level from one to 20 for a past life. But it's not what you really want. It's not going to be an event. Um, you know, running it 20 times on EN, um, which is, you know, so we did silly like easy, you know, um, versus running it on EE because you want that loot chance, you know, is it. So it wasn't just you were running it 20 times. You were also running it 20 times on whatever the easiest possible difficulty was. Because, again, mm -hmm. like you said, it didn't matter. There, You know, um, you accepted think, you weren't going to get loot to drop. Yeah. 20 and, completions uh, was, was more effective. Now, Raid Runes has really really kind of counterpointed that, right? Because there's no longer 20th yeah. completions. You have to get the raid rune. So if you're ransacked, you, there's no re real reason to be running the raid in terms of getting to that 20th completion. You're you're only relying on loot drops, which agreeably are better uh, these days, but it is kind yeah. of a something that has kind of... I don't know if that was an intent um, or a reasoning. I, I suspect it probably was. I like it better myself, but it also... The other thing about raid runes too, while we're kind of on the on that topic, is that has helped with some other ways, right? Like raid runes actually encourage having alts because you can run whichever character you want or the party needs, and you can still be make, making incremental advancements for any character you want. You know, exactly. As opposed to, uh, we need someone to bite the bullet and run a healer for this raid because we don't have anyone healing, um, and no one wants to run, like whoever runs a healer is just wasting a run. You're getting, you're still getting an incremental jump in that that vein. So I think that really helps the rating scene as well. So, well, and also they're they're able to vary the amount so that yeah. there's an additional benefit to running harder difficulties. Absolutely. So you don't get that just crank it out on normal. Um, if you run elite, mentality. you're only running half as many runs as as normal. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we didn't talk about the in, in, the advent of raid runes because it kind of came in the more in the current age, but it's that's true. been a very positive development i think um absolutely so okay um let's talk about level cap raises because we've had obviously that's been something that's been a part of the game from 10 to 30 um you know one of the things that um i noticed is that every time the level cap raises um that there tends to be a smaller set of content that you would now classify as end game because whatever was at the old cap tends to not be there anymore so um how do you feel level cap raises um, change your endgame environment? I think it drives it to a certain extent. You need level cap raises to drive a little extra power and, and enjoyment out of the game. I don't know that I don't know that we necessarily need to go above thirty, but I think 
having a little bit of spread has actually had some benefit. You can introduce new and exciting things. So there's a lot of great things about raising a level cap. You know, the Scion feats you, we didn't have before you got to level 30, all that kind of stuff. Well, Ken, how do you feel about level cap raises as it relates to the end game? Um, I've enjoyed them. It gives you new content to look forward to. Um, you don't get as burned out as fast. I would like to see more in the future myself. Um, I don't know if they should, you know, say they went to 35. Should they make heroics go to 25 then? Because, I mean, right now the karma at 6 million is pretty easy to get. Maybe they should raise that if they're going to raise the level cap with it. So yeah. I, I have some thoughts, I guess, on it. I don't know. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I'm of two minds on the level cap raises. Um, on one hand, I enjoy level cap raises for the opportunity to have new character progression that, like, Patrick mentioned with the the Scion feats at level 30, um, you know, they also incorporated um, extra Epic Destiny feats in there as well when they did the level raise at 29, you know, with um, the three sphere feats, you know, some of which like Dire Charge had a huge impact on, uh, on your character's ability to do certain things, you know, melees with crowd control, for example. Um, so I like level cap raises from the standpoint of the fact that they make the characters more complex, more, you know, um, and they, they create more build options. And that's interesting to me. I enjoy that part of the game. I struggle, though, because a level cap raise also means that um, the, no the amount of end game content you have goes from whatever it was down to something much smaller. Typical level cap raise comes with some content, but, uh, you know, even in the event of Mess of the Underdark, you still went from having. 30 some epic quests plus um, a half dozen or more raids that you could run every day to having one raid and about uh, you know 14 or 15 quests. So um, that can be a little bit of a of a difficulty because it can make it feel like there's less to do. You know, if it's planned out right and they've seeded some content in there, then it works better. But there have been some times, um, like when the cap went to 28, for example, where all you really had to do when the cap first went up was run Shadowfell. Um, and, uh, you know, those two content packs, and there really wasn't any end game raids until they got the Thunderhome stuff out the door. So, you, know, you can get, you can run into some challenges there. Um, but, uh, there may have been some intentionality behind that to drive the um, <laughs> purchasing of Shadowfell. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I get the, the I get the value proposition for level cap raises, both from the developer standpoint and from the player standpoint. Um, I think it's just it's one of those things that I think needs to be planned very carefully um, from a content standpoint, so that you know you don't get that feeling that there's there is no end game, there's nothing to do, um, and uh, and also to make sure that it fits in with everything else that you're doing. Um, they have, seeded, we were... they have seeded it pretty well right now, right? Because we've got a lot of level 31, 32 quests. Yeah, I, I, be... yeah, I mean, well, a lot of that comes into the next thing we were going to talk about, too, which is loot power creep. Um, be before we jump into that, though, yeah. there's on the, the aspect of level cap raises, it'll be interesting to see what happens next because we're at 30. There, there's no current plans, at least that I'm aware of, that of going to higher than 30. So if we don't get any more level caps, level cap raises, which arguably you could say we probably don't really need, it's like, what do you do next anyways? But if you don't do that, how do you keep introducing new challenge to the game? <laughs> it becomes a little trickier, right? Yeah. I mean, I think I think the other negative of level cap raises is the stretching impact we've mentioned, I think, in probably our second segment of this series, where we talked about how um, as the game got to 28 especially, you started to feel like the, the characters were you know, the population is stretched out over a sure. larger level range. And when you go to 30, if you go to 34 or 35 or something, you're, you're, again, you're going to be stretching now um, even further. And so you're going to end up with players who are on, who can't online at the same time, but who can't interact with each other. Um, and that's something that, you know, that, so if there's ways to find progression options that don't include late raising the level cap, things like, Reaper XP, sentient weapons, things like that. You know, those are other things that can uh, can be looked at as well. Yeah, but yeah, 
Um, now, but as I was saying, the loop power creep is a is a factor in making the game making there be a lot of things to do um, because as we've mentioned from the day one, loot farming or you know loot progression has been a big part of your end game set, and I think one of the things they've done well is slavers gear is still valuable um, even though they introduced a bunch of new gear with Ravenloft that has power creep. Legendary shroud items still have a place. Um, you know, some of the uh, items from RSO or Mines of Tethiamir, you know, still have a place. A Jibber's Blade still has a place, although that's a unique item. Yeah, let's, can't, <laughs> let's can't, not use can't, that as a, as a Kenneth cra- can, Even Kenneth Crafted Gear still has a place to some degree. Um, and, you know, so... There's been places, I, though, where that hasn't been very good. No, I agree. You know, I Alchemical weapons pretty much got the short end of the stick uh, because yeah. of timing, and they were the end game loot to get. And then uh, Men's Ender Art came out, and Epic Weapons came out, and suddenly alchemical weapons looked like junk trash. So, I mean, and there's been times where we've gotten new loot, and then um, like the last time they they overhauled um, random loot gen. You know, they they gave us some new loot, and then they came out with random loot gen the next update, and the random loot gen was far and above better than the recent named items. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That was a very odd phase to be in mm-hmm. because every, because every random chest was better than what you could get in a raid. Um, so I, I think that, you know, managing the loot progression and the loot power creep is, is a, um, uh, something that has changed over time. And it's something that needs to be managed closely in order to, uh, to have a good end game scenario because the more you can be complimentary and the, and the less you can be um, uh, invalidating is um, is better. There's the thing that is important to remember is there's, there's a definitive need to have both vertical and horizontal loop progression. The horizontal yes. being stuff that's, you know, you come up with a new pack and the stuff isn't really better. It's just analogous to stuff that already exists. Well, that's really good for people who are just getting into that scene or uh, maybe didn't get the, the older stuff. But vertical is also important because you need to, you know, it, at a certain point, everyone's going to get all the new stuff and they're going to want more stuff that's a little bit better. Or they're going to, you know, if they don't have that thing to chase, they're going to phase out of the game. All right. Um, okay, do you have any thoughts on loot power creep? Um, no, not really. All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's touch, touch in again real quick on Reaper XP. Um, how do you guys feel about where Reaper XP is at right now when you earn it at cap? Uh, I know there's been some changes to this from when it first came out. Do you feel like it's in a good place? Do you feel like it needs some tweaks, pros and cons on it? Are we talking about Reaper or just Reaper XP? Uh, Reaper, is... and, well, uh, let's talk about uh, both. Reaper difficulty um, at cap as well as Reaper XP. Um, at cap because I know one of the early concerns was that Reaper was um, better suited for heroics, both in terms of earning XP and in terms of running it. Um, and, and they've made some changes. Do you feel like they've made enough changes? They've not made enough changes. Um, what do you guys feel like, feel like Reaper is and, and the impact it's had on end game? Why don't you go first working? I would like to see legendary Reaper XP and then Reaper XP. I know that might be a little out there, but have it completely a separate thing of the two. Um, just because at, at this point, when you run something and you're capped and you're doing your level 30 and you're running Reaper XP, the amount of XP that you get for Reaper and the time it takes to do it versus heroic is night and day different still, even with the bump. So my personal opinion, if they had a legendary thing, a lot more people would stay 30 and suit their character up and run stuff on Reaper um, at the end game, which would give more end game content for me at least, because I would stay at 30 and farm Reaper XP, legendary Reaper XP if there was such a thing. So I think you touched on a major need to have something else tying players to level 30. Um, I don't think Reaper XP is the answer to that. Uh, we could talk about what that looks like later. But the thing with Reaper is what are you running it for? 
if you want the challenge and stuff, if it's just about challenge, y- you have a new end game system in the sense that you can be at level 30 and try and run these quests at high levels uh, or, or high skulls. Uh, and that can be a challenge for you and kind of expand what you can do at level 30. If you're just trying to do the progression part of it, yeah, it, it's pretty hard to argue against the idea that while you're reincarnating and going from 1 to 20, that it's going to be more time efficient, which I think is certainly a problem. Um, but I think there's, there's... I think kind of what you're speaking to, Morkane, is, is I don't see it necessarily... I think if you tie it to Reaper, it's only going to cause more problems, probably. I, I think there needs to be... I mean, certainly, there. I, I could see a point where, you know, Epic and then Legendary should have incremental bumps in how much Reaper XP you're getting, so maybe if they made it so if you're running an Epic quest, it's double the Reaper XP to start with, and then Legendary, it's triple what it would have been to start with, or something like that. I, I definitely would like to see something like that where it, you had more incentive to run Reapers up in there in those levels, but I don't know that because Reaper is a system that works from essentially level 2 to 30, I don't see it as being a system that's going to tie people to wanting to stay at level 30, which I think we need, but I don't think Reaper is that, that answer. The other thing about Reaper in general that we didn't really talk about yet is, again, it's it's encouraging players to focus on fewer characters because if you want to get those wings, which look really awesome, that's a significant investment in time. I would love to have those wings. I'm not, I, I can't see myself focusing on one character that much and heaven forbid, I need to run that many lives cause I, I just can't <laughs> to do what some of those people have done to get to that point. Um, you're right. As I balance, for myself, that time versus challenge, uh, you know, to get what I'm looking to get and, and balance what I want to get with all all the characters I am running, you know, it's all of that stuff, all of this Reaper stuff really kind of can focus people on fewer and fewer characters. Yep, absolutely. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, right, let's, Let's move on to a couple of other um, different progression systems that kind of exist right now. Um, we've kind of talked about reincarnation heavily, but let's touch on um, on crafting for a minute. Um, you know, what role do you guys feel like Kaneth crafting, which I guess came out, you know, not too long ago with the new versions? How do you feel like that fits within the um, the current endgame scenario and? What, if anything, could be done there to make it an interesting piece of the puzzle? I don't know how much of an endgame mechanic it is. Um, it definitely helps you kind of flesh out your, your gear for what you need. Um, I, I think whether, probably marginally intentionally, but also just kind of the way things work, you come out, if you just look at named items, you, there's always going to be something missing from what you'd really want for your optimized gear set. Um, I think that has probably more to do with the variety of what people try to do with their builds than anything else. Um, so I think it's really important to have a, a system like that. Um, I don't know how much of an endgame thing it is, but it, it certainly supports whatever you want to do. Working? Any thoughts on Kenneth Crafting? Is it something you've been working with? Do you enjoy doing it? Yeah, I enjoyed getting the levels up and... Um, you know, when you find the ingredients in the quest that you needed, it's kind of cool. Um, but at end game, I don't tend to use Kenneth crafting as much. Um, I may, if I have an item, I just can't find it. I'll go craft something until I can get that item. But yeah, it's that end game. I, I just don't. It's all right, but it's not the gear you're going to get like from Ravenloft, you know? I mean, sure. I think it's an appropriate power level for balancing between named loot and new loot and stuff like that and raid loot. Um, and it, but it definitely helps fill in the gaps, which I think is really where it shines a little bit better. Mm. All right. Yeah, you know, we, we talked a lot about um, other loot options as well, such as, you know, with the raid runes and the sentient weapons. Um, 
tomes have come up a couple of times um, and there are different types of tomes out there and that hasn't always been the case obviously we didn't really cover this in our history you know but we started off with stat tomes and those of course have gotten higher we you know added skill tomes um, and those have gotten higher we've added the, there were the tomes of fate and you know most recently with Ravenloft there was the um, racial AP tome um, so uh, yeah, we've got you know several different tome options. Not to mention the more uh, single-use tomes of learning. Um, are there other you know? But a lot of these, besides the stat and the skill tomes, aren't available in game. Um, what do you guys think about um, the tomes that are available in game? With the recent changes to the raids and the uh, plus sevens and plus eights, how do you feel like the availability of tomes are? What would you like to see with in terms of tomes? I think it'd be nice if you could turn raid runes in for tomes for starters. Okay, I'd agree with that. Seems kind of like Working. a no-brainer, given that tomes are have been a part of writing for since the start, essentially. In that they, just, okay, sure they they put them sort of back in the loot tables, and I mean they're dropping. I've seen plus sevens drop in in Baba and and uh, Strahd several times, but I mean if they're gonna drop it there, you'd think you could turn raid runes in for them, which would only make it more people run the raids longer because now you can get tomes out of them. You know you can get a tome out of it. So, Especially some of those tomes that aren't dropping in the game that you can only get from the DDO store. If they added those to raids, that'd probably be a good thing. How would you guys feel about something like the um, like a like a plus one or a plus two racial AP tome dropping or even just a regular AP tome dropping? Yeah, I mean, certainly wouldn't mind getting another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Or available via raid room purchases. There's some options yeah, I, there. Yeah, I agree that those would be nice. I have them in the raid scene or at end game where you can get them more so. I think what we All should right. do here is let's, uh, let's wrap this section up, uh, and we'll do one more session uh, and kind of finish this up uh, next time uh, and kind of go more into where we, where we would like to see Endgame go in the near near to longish future um, so thanks for listening uh, you can join us next time we'll finish this discussion up uh, and th thank you to my guests Warcane and Asheris today uh, if you would like thank to you. support the show uh, visit our website ditocast.com uh, you can find uh, you can also support us on Patreon uh, you can support I find show notes, past shows, and other fun stuff on our website, uh, ddocast.com. You can also find us at social media. Uh, I'm the, at ddocast on Twitter. That's uh, where you can find the latest cast updates. If you'd like to join the discussion, uh, we'll leave, you can leave us a comment, or you can send us an email, ddocast at gmail.com. So until next time, may all your tack rules be crits, all your chests level appropriate, have fun, and don't forget to gather for bus.